what you're doing, Neil. Matt's got the heads off that car and already has them mounted in the holding fixtures on the bench. Okay, Jack, I'll go right over. Gee, I'm sorry I'm late, Matt. No harm done, Neil. We've got this valve job to do. There's also a bearing knock I've pinned down to the number six cylinder, probably a rod bearing. Let's do the valves first and then tackle the bearings. I've just finished filing off the last burr in the valve stem lock groove. Got to knock those burrs off or they'll score the guides when the valves are removed. So uh, take the valves out and put them in the rack. Next thing we'll do is clean the valves. Just hold each valve firmly against this wire brush. Be sure to clean the carbon off all surfaces, the valve head, the face, and the stem. Uh, clean them thoroughly, Neil. If some carbon or gum remains, the valves will stick. Okay, Tech, I get the idea. These look fine, Neil. You did a good job. Now, mic the stems for wear. If stem wear is more than two thousandths, replace the valve because you'll want to check the guide with a full-size valve stem. Well, these are going to be all right, Matt. Nothing over two thousandths. Good. Valve guides, remember, are integral with the head in all our current V8 engines. Before we can inspect for guide wear, the carbon and varnish in them must be cleaned out. Use this valve guide cleaning tool for the job. Carbon deposits in the combustion chambers have got to go, too. Tech's right. Head and block surfaces must be perfectly clean and free from distortion. And combustion chambers can't have any sharp edges. Here's why. Carbon flakes, spark plug, thread protrusions, or gasket edges can heat up in the chamber and cause surface combustion. So, this is a good time to guard against that. Well, I've got the guides in the combustion chambers all cleaned up. Want to take a look? I notice you did a good job. Let's see how much wear there is in the guides. Install this sleeve over the stem, then install the valve in the head. Mount the dial indicator on the cylinder head so the plunger rests on the edge of the valve head. Got that? Yep. Have it ready in a second. Gently move the valve head toward and away from the indicator. The total indicator movement should not exceed 10 thousandths on the intake valves or 14 thousandths on the exhaust valves. You'll have to ream the guides and install valves with oversized stems if guides are worn. Well, we won't have to ream these guides, Matt. Guide wear is under the service limits. But supposing we did have too much guide wear, how'd we go about reaming the guide? You'd use this solid type spiral flute reamer, not an expansion type. There are valves available with five, 15, or 30 thousandths oversized stems. Tech's right, Neil, and when you start to ream, select a reamer that's the first oversized from standard. Work gradually to get a guide size that will take the oversized valves required. But our present valves and guides are not worn too much, so let's go on with the next step. Refacing the valves calls for a refacing machine that's in good condition. The valve chuck bearings must be good so the chuck runs true. The wheel must be dressed until its surface is smooth and true. If the machine's okay, put a valve in the chuck. Then turn the motor on and watch the head rotate to see if the valve is warped. Exhaust valves, remember, are exposed to combustion temperatures that can heat them up to 1,800 degrees. They even run at a cherry red heat at or near wide open throttle, so checking for warpage is a good idea. Well, these valves look perfectly all right to me. That's fine. A valve slightly warped, though, is still okay if it can be refaced and still have a satisfactory margin. By margin, we mean the unround edge of the valve. It extends from the top of the valve head to the upper limit of the face. Let's grind our valves and see how they clean up. Okay. What we're after is an angle of 45 degrees on the face, 45 on the seat. 45 degrees on the face and on the seat. Okay. Right. And when you start grinding, feed the wheel slowly into the valve and take a very light cut. Not too much pressure. Next, move the valve slowly across the face of the wheel. Never move the valve off the wheel, and don't remove any more material than is required to true up the valve. Incidentally, whenever you want to inspect your work or when grinding is finished, move the wheel away from the valve. Keep a close eye on the valve to be sure a definite margin is left. Uh, how much margin are we shooting for? 
at least one thirty-second of an inch, Neil. Any less than that, discard the valve. Knife edge margins weaken the head too much and mean the valve had too much warpage to begin with. Tech's right. Too thin a margin makes the valve apt to break or chip at the edges. Also, the edges overheat and can cause pre-ignition or a popping back through the carburetor. Well, I finished facing the valves and none have sharp edges at the margin. Fine. And we're ready to true up the valve seats. This is a precision operation. The seat must be square with the guide and concentric within two thousandths total indicator reading. And like I said before, the angle of the seat must be the same as the face angle, 45 degrees on this V8 engine. To get such a precise angle, be sure to use the correct size valve guide pilot with a reseating stone. A pilot that isn't self-centering in the guide can turn out a seat that's off-center, and the valve face won't rest squarely on the seat. Keep in mind that valve seats in our V8 engines are integral with the head. Only a light grind is needed. So support the weight of the tool to take a very light cut. Good point, Matt. And when you've ground the seats, measure their concentricity. Remember, they must be true within two thousandths total indicator reading. Two thousandths? Okay. If the seats are true and were carefully ground, finish grinding or lapping in isn't necessary. I'll check this operation off then, Matt. We're right on the button all the way. Good going. Now we're ready to inspect seat width. Wide seats tend to collect carbon and hold valves open so they can burn. Narrow seats don't give valves a chance to transfer the heat and they run too hot. A proper seat is about 1 16th inch wide and is located midway between the top and bottom of the valve face. Here's how you can verify the seating. Spread a thin coating of Prussian blue on the valve seat. Put the valve in the guide so the head rests on the seat. Turn the valve one quarter turn. Lift it up and inspect the contact. A seat too wide can be narrowed. Use a 20 degree stone on the upper surface or a 60 degree stone on the lower surface. It depends on the location of the seat on the face. Well, these valve seats are all right, Matt. We must be getting good. That's fine, Neil. Now, when you work on the engine that has hydraulic tappets, remove the tappets for cleaning. Then test the tappets for leak down and replace any that are not satisfactory. Remove, clean, and test for leak down. Okay, I'll keep it in mind. But since this engine we're working on has mechanical tappets, we won't have to worry about that now, huh? That's right, Neil. But here's something you ought to worry about and pretty quick. Somebody had better turn this record over because we just about run out of grooves. This valve reconditioning job is really coming along, Neil. Maybe you'll even get an A on your report card. Well, I hope so, Tech. But don't forget, I was kind of late getting started. I hate to break up this tea party, fellas, but we've still got valve springs to inspect. They should always be tested for distortion, free length, and compressed pressure. It's certainly no secret that valve springs work under pretty rugged conditions. One end rests on the hot cylinder head, the spring is being flexed constantly, and it's housed under the rocker cover where little cooling air can strike it. Springs that become overheated lose tension and won't open or close the valves as quickly as needed. What's more, they might not hold the valves tightly seated or close them fast enough without bouncing. That would cause a high speed miss or poor top speed performance. Okay, Matt, what's first? A distortion check. Use a square and surface plate to see how squarely the spring sits. And check the spring at both ends. No coil should be more than 1 16th inch away from the square. Then use this testing tool to see if compressed pressure and spring height at which you get the pressure is the same as that specified in the service manual. All right, Matt. Better give me a few minutes. Only two springs lost tension and needed replacement, Matt. The rest tested out and measured okay. Good. Use compressed air to clean off the cylinder heads. Then coat the valve stems with oil and install each valve in the guide from which it was removed. Install new cup seals too, Neil. Push them down into position over the end of the stem guides. Do I put seals on intake and exhaust valves? 
Good question. But I'd say that if both intake and exhaust valves had seals originally, replace all the seals with new ones. If the engine you're working on just has intake seals, then replace only those. After the seals, install the valve springs, retainers, and locks. Springs with two or more closed coils at one end should have that end installed toward the cylinder head. The intake stems on some engines are grooved to take a valve lock with two beads. Exhaust valves are grooved to take a lock with four beads. In case you wondered about that, the four bead valve lock is strictly a design feature that helps the valve rotate during operation. That, of course, minimizes the possibility of burning. I see, Matt. Clear enough. What now? Now we've got to measure installed spring height. Measure from the bottom of the spring seat in the cylinder head to the bottom of the valve spring retainer. Look up the installed spring height measurements in the service manual. If your measurement is too high, install a 1 16th inch spacer in the head counter bore. If spacers have already been used, make your measurements from the top of the spacer. Got it? I read you, Matt. Over and out. Installed spring heights are all good, Matt. Fine. We always test for installed height, so we'll be sure that the spring in operating position will have proper tension to do its job. Now, before we reinstall the heads, let's drain the oil and drop the oil pan. Then we can look into that bearing knock I told you about. Suppose you check the rod bearing caps to be sure they're marked. Got to be sure to get them back in their original positions. Then remove the cap from number six rod, and we'll take a look at the bearing. OK, Matt. I'll have that cap off in a minute. Say, this bearing sure has a funny color. That doesn't mean it's worn, Neil. Many different bearing materials are being used today, and they'll usually discolor under service. Only signs of flaking, pitting, or scoring will tell you whether a bearing is damaged. Best way to tell whether new bearings are needed is to measure the clearance. From the sludge I saw in this engine, I suspect the owner didn't change oil or the oil filter as often as he was supposed to. You can use a small piece of 1,000th brass shim stock or the plastic gauge method for measuring clearance, Neil. But wipe the connecting rod journal, cap, and bearings clean first. Details on both measuring methods are in this reference book. I'll look it over, Tech. Thanks. We'll probably have to install a new pair of standard bearings to bring number six up to clearance specifications. Before you do that, though, mic the connecting rod journal. It shouldn't be tapered nor out of round more than one thousandth. Well, it's under a thousandth, Matt. Guess we can install the new bearings. Fine. Now, since this one rod bearing was worn, we'd better measure the clearance of all the rod bearings to be on the safe side. All right, Matt. Give me a few minutes. We put in a new set of standard size bearings and all the rods, Matt. We also made sure the tabs on the bearings lined up with the grooves on the rods. All of the old ones showed too much wear to take a chance. Good going, Tech. You didn't forget to mic the rod journals and keep your installations clean, I hope. Well, we were mighty careful, Matt. Tech explained how a small piece of foreign matter on the journal could embed itself in the lining material and damage both the bearing and the journal. He also told me about foreign material behind the bearing. Gee, I didn't realize it could cause a high spot and result in damage to the bearing. So I wiped off the journals, caps, both sides of the bearings, and torqued the rod bolt nuts to 45 foot-pounds. Fine. Now let's inspect and measure clearance of the main bearings while we're at it. We'll get a good idea of their condition by looking at the lower halves. When you use plastic gauge to check crankshaft bearings, be sure to use a jack to support the shaft as outlined in the reference book. Then, remove only one bearing at a time, Neil. Leave the other mains tightened to help hold the crankshaft in place. Okay. And I'll mark the caps so we'll get them back properly. Here's the first one. Well, main bearing clearances were well within specifications. They've got plenty of service left. This owner won't have to pay for a new set of mains. Let's be sure our main bearing caps are tightened to 85 foot-pounds. After that, 
Let's change the oil filter element. Then we can go ahead and reinstall the oil pan. Next, we'll check the oil return holes to see that they're not plugged. In addition, we'll check water passage openings in the heads and block to see that they're not clogged. When we install the heads, we'll use new gaskets, of course. Coat them with sealer before you install them. And before you reinstall the heads, inspect the ends of the rocker arms for wear. Replace any that are worn. Adjusting screws should have a minimum torque of 18 inch pounds or they'll back out and increase the clearance. If you can't get that torque, the adjusting screws and possibly the arms should be replaced. And as you install the heads, rocker arm brackets and arms, use this torque wrench to tighten the head bolts in the proper sequence and to correct torque specifications. When you've drawn down each bolt, go around once more and get a second torque reading on each bolt. Proper tightening is mighty important. All right, I'll recheck them all. Fine. Inspect the push rods next and replace any that are worn or bent. Then install the push rods with the small ends toward the tappets and slide the rocker arms over the push rods. When you work on an engine with hydraulic tappets, you torque the head bolts down in proper sequence. Then you install the rocker arm shaft brackets and tighten their hold down bolts to 30 foot-pounds torque. Hey, wait a minute, Buster. You forgot one critical point. When you tighten those hold down bolts, you gotta allow time for hydraulic tappets to bleed down to normal operating length. Oh my gosh, yes. If you tighten those bolts too quickly, you can bend the push rods and even belly out the tappet bodies. Then the engine will really be noisy. Okay, Matt. I'll watch that on hydraulic tappet jobs. It's a good idea, Neil. Now, on any engine, be sure to tighten down the manifold stud nuts evenly, as well as the head bolts. Many a valve job is spoiled by careless tightening. Here's another tip. Install and properly tighten new spark plugs of the correct type for the engine being worked on. All new parts, in fact, should be factory recommended. Don't let a good job fall short because plugs or parts you're not sure of are installed. Very clear. Now, what else do we have to do? Well, we've changed the oil filter, so let's put in the proper amount of fresh MS oil along with some break-in oil. Run the engine at slow idle long enough for the oil and coolant to reach operating temperature. Then, on engines like this with mechanical tappets, adjust intake tappet clearance to 10 thousandths, exhaust to 18 thousandths. As a final step, we'll take the car out on the road and see how well we've done the valve and bearing work. No need to worry about this car, Matt. I think you and Neil did a very thorough job. But if anybody has questions, he'll find some mighty helpful answers in this reference book. Use them to keep those customers happy. <laughs>